Why was a Bible kicked around in Seattle and nobody was arrested for it? Welcome to Answers News for Monday, July 11th, 2022. Hi hey guys, I am Brian Osborne. This is Dr. Jennifer Rivera, forensic scientist, and Rob Webb, uh, the rocket scientist on the end. And we've got a studio audience here with us. Will you guys clap and make yourselves known and heard for those watching? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. We got the nice. yeehaws there. Yeah, we right. got the yeehaw. Look at that. Yeehaw. Nicely done. <laughs> well, welcome you guys who are here. Welcome those who are watching online. Welcome to Answers News, a biblical commentary on the issues of our day. And we'll just kind of mm -hmm. dive right into what Rob was teeing up for us there a second ago. Yeah. So, Holy Bible demonstratively desecrated in Seattle. So what happened is there is someone on Twitter who's called the Seattle Preacher who posted this video online of a group of people who are playing soccer with the Bible. Mm -hmm. So they kicked it around on the ground just to show their disdain for the Bible and the principles it advocates for, probably in large due to the issue of life with Roe v. Wade being a big thing right now. And then after they kicked it around for a bit playing soccer with the Bible, then they promptly threw it into the porta potty where they think the Bible belongs. Yeah, I mean, obviously I just wrote Romans 1 here. This is Romans 1 just in full effect right here. They ultimately know God in their heart of their hearts, but they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And Romans 1 says they're haters of God, right? They, they know God exists, but they're in rebellion against him. Really, it's prideful rebellion against their creator. And it just reminds me of Judges 21-25. When there was no king in Israel, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So essentially they're being reduced to this lawlessness that we're seeing today. And really this is just a result of a culture that has abandoned God. God's word and his law. And it's just basically, we're seeing that compromise as well with the lies of the culture. They have traded the truth about God for the lie of the culture. And, and, and we're seeing that through and through here. And, and obviously they, they talk a lot about, you know, um, in terms of other religions, but really it's, it's against the triune God of the Bible because they know the true God of the Bible exists. All the other man-made religions, they don't go after them because they know those ones don't exist in their heart of their hearts. And that's why they attack the true God of the Bible. That's why they attack his word and his word alone. And that's what we were saying. If they were had kick, been kicking around like a Koran or, or, you know, possibly even, you know, another version of some other religions, their sacred works, they wouldn't be as upset, right? Yeah, they wouldn't be exactly. um, admonishing it as much as we see, especially here, you know, Christians being upset by this. And, you know, they say it is a hate crime. Basically, if you're destroying the religious material, we say, of another person's religion, it could be considered a hate crime. And... But they're going to ignore it because it is the word of God. Yeah, and it's interesting. I don't think these people would kick around the Koran in mm -hmm. public, especially in like the Middle East. Because there would be consequences mm -hmm. for that. That'd be one reason. And also the Koran's not the word of the living God. The Bible actually is. And so in our heart of hearts, we know that it is. And those who are submitting to Christ want to uh, suppress that truth in unrighteousness, as you just said, Rob, of uh, actually Romans chapter 1. Mm -hmm. It's also intriguing that in our culture, most of the people who are in our main lines of social media and have the public voices, they don't care too much that the Bible is kicked around. Right now, if it was the Quran or something like that, they may be upset because it's offending these people, but not the Bible. Why? Because they don't like the Bible because it's a suppression of truth. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ultimately, that's what it yeah. really is. Exactly. And I just think it's interesting at the very end, they point out the first states to ban abortions were in the Bible Belt, and they list off Missouri, Kentucky, Oklahoma, Arkansas, blah, blah, blah. And it just, it just confirms really it's the biblical worldview that has the preconditions to actually value life, right? It's only through God's word that we can actually say that the child from the moment of fertilization is tremendously valuable because that child is made in the image of God, fearfully and wonderfully made. No other worldview can say that. No other worldview can do that. So that's why we're kind of seeing that connection as, as well. And then the article also goes on. They talk a lot about church-state relations as well. You know, it's conservative majorities expanding the right to religious exercise at the expense of church-state separation. But really, if you actually look at it, what Romans 13 is talking about, that the government is to be God's deacon, right? It's to be God's servant, right? So there was never the assumption that the state was going to be separated from God, that, there, that there's going to be different spheres of sovereignty, right? You have the church sovereignty and you have the state sovereignty, right? So you're seeing that mixing all the way through and through, and you're seeing that misconception by a lot of people in terms of what that actually means. It's, it's not that the state was, was ever supposed to be separated by God. The state is supposed to be answering to God and supposed to be upholding justice according to his word. And I do think we're going to see more and more of this, oh, you know, yeah. especially, you know, in the coming months and yeah. 
this yeah. persecution on Christians, yeah. and, and I just, it's so, we just have to remember we have to stand strong on the, you know, on the truth that we know in God's word, right? As Christians, That's we're exactly going to be right. tested, we're going to be challenged, mm -hmm. and we just always have to remember um, where our home is, right? This earth is not our home, and we're going to see horrible things like this happening, but... Um, we know the Lord is still in control, so that's, right. that's uh, the amazing part of it. Amen. And speaking of the suppression of truth and the attack on Christianity, as you just mentioned, that leads right into the next article from Twitter. Twitter just permanently banned a pastor after he told people the wages of sin is death and implored them to turn to Christ. And so basically this guy was just giving straightforward biblical truth. And by giving straightforward biblical truth, he's an associate pastor of a church over in Texas, has a, a decent uh, influence on social media evidently. But by giving biblical truth, then Twitter said, no, we don't like that. We're going to shut you down. And here's what the actual tweet said. He said this, question, what do abortion, adultery, bestiality, child sacrifice, homicide, homosexuality, idolatry, incest, and witchcraft all have in common? According to the Bible, they all deserve death. Death is the penalty. They deserve the death penalty. Then he says this. He doesn't stop there. He says, turn from your sin to the Lord Jesus Christ and live and be saved. And so his basic message is, we're all sinners. We need a Savior, which mm -hmm. is the whole thrust mm -hmm. of the Bible. And so just by giving this general teaching of the Bible, he was kicked off Twitter. Yeah, so much for the tolerance, right, of right. these so-called folks, right? And so much for the free speech rights, of course, that they're always trying to talk about. But really, we need to be praying for this brother, um, Gabriel, that, that he, can, he keeps speaking truth, you know. And, yep. and for all of us as well as Christians, we need to make sure that we're continuing to proclaim that truth, not watered down, not compromise on the gospel, because that is what true love does. True love warns of the danger to come, right? True love warns of a judgment to come, and true love points to the only hope of That's forgiveness, right. that is through Jesus Christ. So, you know, just through and through, this just reminds me of some Bible verses here. Hebrew 4.12, the Bible is sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Judges, thoughts, attitudes of the heart. Jeremiah 23, 29 says, Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, like a hammer that breaks the rocks in pieces. So we're seeing that right there. And it just reminds me, um, just a few weeks ago, um, me and a few other brothers, we decided to go out to the Pride event in Cincinnati. And we were out there just doing some preaching. And as soon as we opened up our Bible and started quoting Scripture, that's when you saw everyone just losing their mind because that is the Bible, because it's the Word of God, right? Going out, actually accomplishing God's Word, accomplishing its will and just showing that exactly what the Bible says that the darkness hates the light right lest its deeds be exposed and and just some encouragement as well if, if you're out there and you're continuing to proclaim truth just know that Jesus said if the world hates you keep in mind that it hated me first so we're promised pro you know persecution right. and he also says in John 12 the one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. So it's just a reminder that those that hear God's word and reject it and get angry, they're not getting angry at you. They're getting angry at the one that created them, right? They're in rebellion against their creator. And what I love about this, too, is he included the gospel message so simply, right? Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. ended it, you know, with the promise of salvation. There is an answer for those of you who are in, you know, experiencing all this, these sins and everything that, you know, the pleasures you like to say of the world. And, you know, the Bible's living and active. It tells us that. And that's why I love just opening the Bible yeah. sometimes to yeah. people is almost like holding up a mirror in front of their face and making them realize, mm -hmm. right? Because as we said, that's you're, right. it's an inborn, you're born with the knowledge of God. You can try and suppress it, but it's there. You can't deny it. And yeah. when some, you start reading scripture, or opening your Bible to people, that mirror starts to reflect that right back in their face. And it makes mm -hmm. them extremely uncomfortable. They don't like what they see. Yeah, they, they don't can't like escape, what they, they see. They can't escape being made mm -hmm. in the image of God and yeah. living in God's created world, no matter how far they run, no matter how, how much they, they close their eyes and pretend like it doesn't exist, it's always going to be there. So that's what it comes down Interesting. to. Interesting. I saw a little quote uh, on some social media platform the other day. It said this, that real Christianity is not popular and that popular Christianity isn't Christianity. Right? That's we right. need to understand that and be okay with that being unpopular. Now, we want to be loving and engaging and winsome as we do proclaim truth, but we want to be bold in that proclamation yeah. and expect it to be unpopular in a very secular culture. That's right. Yeah. We want to make sure we're persecuted for preaching God's word, for preaching the gospel, but not for our own attitude, right? right? We're not being a jerk out there, but we're actually treating these people with gentleness and respect and pointing them to the truth. And naturally, like Jesus says, we're going to be persecuted for that because the world hates God. And then there's no segue from that to this next article <laughs> other than ungodly truth. All right, but here we go. Uh, middle ear of humans evolved from fish gills according to study. Well, if there was a study, then it must be true, right? 
Uh, and so if you're not familiar, according to evolutionary ideology, humans did evolve from fish along the chain. So you have uh, bottom sea dwellers, fish, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, humans. That's the suggested order of evolution over time. So humans evolved from fish. So when you catch a fish, you're catching an ancestor, and that's being really mean and cruel. You should throw it back or whatever. Yeah. Right, but anyway, or yeah, be a cannibal and eat the eating, fish, you're right? Eating fish, uh, you like know. Like salmon or, and tilapia. Your ancestors, you're eating your relatives. Yeah. Long John Silver, <laughs> yeah. um, people <laughs> still go to those. And <laughs> Uh, and so the whole article is about how they think they've made a connection between particular fish. So they found a fish fossil supposedly 438 million years old. And it had the, mm -hmm. they actually make a cast of the fish brain, which was the size of a thumbnail, basically. Which is kind of cool, though. Which is very, they, they, that's they observational that. science, right? right? right. Yeah. Making a cast of the brain, it's in the present. Mm -hmm. We can see the cast. We can look at what's going on there, the different features of it. Uh, now, the age, 438 million years old, that's not observable. That's, that's their inference. That's their mm -hmm. interpretation rooted on their assumptions and worldview. But the brain itself, the cast, that is observable. Then they look at the Gillespie, which is a jawless fish, supposedly 420 million years old. And they found what they call preserved fil gill filaments. And they... Through looking at these two different creatures, different fish, and other assumptions, they think they found a connection. They found the spiracle that has, that has between the slits and the eyes, there's a spiracal slit there that allows the mouth and allows certain species to breathe. And so the spiracal structure is what evidently evolved into the middle ear later on and four-legged vertebrates as creatures with backbones, which eventually evolved into us. And so by finding this spherical little slit that makes breathing possible for certain water creatures, they say that proves we evolved from fish. Yeah, and that's a really big, big, big issue. Like you were saying, they basically say it proves the line from fish gills to human ear, but really, you don't want to say that in science. You never want to say something proves with an absolute fact, really. But the best that they can say is they interpret that evidence based on their worldview, based on how they actually view it to fit their story. And that's all it is, it's just a story. So, um, yeah, I mean, just the, the whole thing through and through is that false narrative, of course, you know, fish to philosophers, that, like we're saying. So, really, I think we just need to scale back all this. All it's these just fish kind of interesting here. how they're using gills. I, I mean, was for gills the and spiracles, no, both of which are involved in respiration that's right. of fish to then Even today. evolve into hearing, which is a completely different sense. Right, yeah. <laughs> and amazingly complicated. Which is really interesting, I know. Yeah. And the human ear, right. I mean, there's no way they've evolved into these three tiny little bones that are the exact size and then the exact location to you know, allow for human mm -hmm. hearing. It, it's so finite. They're the smallest bones in our body. Mm -hmm. uh, there's just no way, right? And we've it's got a impossible. great video on this, right? We so do. Dr. We have the hearing ear and the seeing eye yep, by, by Dr. Dr. David Menton. Yep. yep. And they're both phenomenal. They really are. And it's amazing. What you tend to find, I think, with these, these sorts of assumptions, they take a superficial connection. It seems to have some resemblance to each other. They think, oh, this seems to look like it may go together in some way, shape, or form. And they say, oh, well, then that means if we assume an evolutionary relationship that one evolved into the other based on their superficial uh, connection in their own minds. But when you look at the details of what you're looking at, it's actually so complex. The connection is obliterated. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the actual function of the human ear, the actual function of gills, what they actually do is so amazingly mm -hmm. complex. To get one to change to the other by long, slow, gradual micro changes will not work in reality. I mean, one reality. little change would cause the entire thing to fail. It would, mm -hmm. absolutely. Right. It couldn't possibly gain information not and turn close, into these things. Right? So. And so it sounds like it's a good mm -hmm. story, but when you apply the story to reality, mm -hmm. it just doesn't, doesn't work. work. They're all just playing it by ear. And, the whole time. Uh, I, I've been surprised. There's been a low number of puns. I've been expecting <laughs> I, I more yeah. from Rob. I'm sorry. Yeah. It was just irresistible. I couldn't, yeah, irresistible. Couldn't You're irritated by it. Um, yeah. But the, uh, and so, I can't anymore. But <laughs> they also say in the article, many important structures of human beings can be traced back to our fish ancestors, such as our teeth, jaws, middle ears, etc. And, and guys, understand that all that is just an interpretation based on their worldview. We do find observable facts. We do look at fish brains. We do look at gills. But then how do you interpret them? How did they get there? What is the connection to fish and us? That's all based on your worldview and your assumptions and the narrative that you're using to interpret present day observations. And so, no, those things don't point to a common ancestor. They point to a common designer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And like, like Jennifer was saying, my, my, this, this whole thing in terms of the design of the ear and everything like that, it just shows the awesome... Uh, creative works of our awesome God, really. But you think about the statement going back to our fish ancestors and, and the consequences of that illogical worldview. If That's you're right. saying that our ancestors were fish, you then destroy the foundation for knowledge, the foundation for rationality, for logic, for morality, even science itself. We're talking about science throughout this entire thing, but really science depends on the uniformity of nature. It depends on our reliable senses. Laws but of logic. Laws of mm -hmm. logic, all these different things. But if our ancestors were just fish, 
they don't have a basis for any of that. They also say that we're just fizzing chemical gas, right? We're just fizzing, bubbling, uh, you know, just this brain gas. Think about like a soda can, right? We're just fizzing thoughts, right? So if we're just fizzing thoughts and we don't have actually any free will of thoughts, right? We're just, we're just saying whatever the chemistry was, was forcing us to say, right? So they're actually kind of, they're, you're basically seeing that borrowing, right? Mm -hmm. They're borrowing from the biblical worldview. They'd be able to make any of these observations. And that, again, just points to our awesome God and the true God of the Bible. I mean, think about it. If your brain evolved from fish brains, how could you trust your own thoughts? How do you know they are logical and orderly? And by the way, what does logic come from? Logic is not tangible. Now it's real. See the consequences of laws of logic, but where did these laws of logic actually come from? And if evolution is true or were true, why don't the laws of logic randomly change? And if they yeah. did, you couldn't think to begin with. And right. so you're, you're caught in a catch-22 for the secularists. But the biblical worldview explains where we come from, rightly, made in God's mm -hmm. image as human beings. Also, mm -hmm. we, there are laws of logic. Why and they we reflect see the flip God's flop thinking. again. The flip-flop on the order of events. Maybe yep. the Bible tells us fish are created on day five and reproduced according to their yeah. kind, and humans created on day six in right. the image of God. We see, once again, that evolution is always going to do that. Their order is completely reversed from what yeah. we see right. clearly in God's Word. Right. Yeah, so make sure you guys keep that in mind when you're looking at those worldview issues. And we're not done with the fish yet. So here's the next article. You need to tell us about Evo Devo. Oh, Evo Devo. I'm so excited. It's a brand, it's a brand new dance crave. That's, no, okay. So how did vertebrates evolve jaws? Now, this is not jaws, the shark in the movie, right? But like yeah. literal jaws. How did the vertebrates, yeah. creatures with backbones, how did they evolve jaws? Scientists reveal clues about evolutionary origin of jaws by studying embryonic development of zebrafish, an approach known as Evo Devo. Which sounds so fancy. Sounds like, like gotta, a dance move, right? Does, show me your right? best Evo Devo. So show me your best. What you got? Uh, and so basically the idea is that you can watch certain things develop. And then as you look at different fish, and the whole argument here is that you have different fish and different jawless fish and different variations of fish that supposedly evolved uh, jaws over time. So you go from jawless fish to jawfish, which evolved into us over time. And so how do you, how do you get there? And they think, well, some of the jawless, jawless fish and fish with jaws have similar developmental patterns for where the jaws and jawless stuff come from. And so maybe since they come from a similar developmental pattern, maybe they have a similar evolutionary trajectory over time. And therefore, this connection of where they come from and development proves evolution. And we're back to homology again. And you're back yeah. to homology. Where we see similar, define that right. for the people, by the way. What right. is homology? So basically, homology is that similar design that we do see throughout living mm -hmm. things. Yep. Many things have eyes, and we have eyes, they have ears, you know, primates have ears. Those they say, oh, primates your closest ancestor. Well, they have lungs, we have lungs, they have hearts, we have hearts. Right. We can study their anatomy and learn a lot and then apply it to human anatomy. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't, it's not evidence of evolution. It's evidence that we have a common designer. I, I love what our founder and CEO, Ken Ham, said. I, I like to use his quote a lot because he says, basically, he says, we all live on the same earth. We're eating the same food. We're breathing the same air. We would expect to see mm -hmm. similar designs since similar we all features. are made up of similar cells. Yeah, that's right. And so we would all need to function in this environment. So it makes sense that it we does. would see this design. And it's just a common creator God, not evolutionary processes. Yeah, exactly. Like if you've ever designed code, you know, for a long time, I, I was a code programmer. Anytime you have a piece of code that works, you're going to duplicate that mm -hmm. piece of code for different projects, yeah. for different programs to be able That's to right. fulfill similar purposes. That's kind of the same way that mm -hmm. our God did it. Um, but just basically, kind of like the last article, just make sure you guys are always separating the facts from the fiction. Of course, there's a lot of storytelling in this, you know. Uh, I, I mean, just, just in the very first sentence, I, I could just see, once upon a time, 500 million years ago, it was relatively safe to go back into the water. Oh, yeah. you know? I'm glad you read that. I forgot to read that. Yeah, <laughs> it was safe to go swimming line. again. It was, it was safe <laughs> yeah, to go yeah. swimming again. So you kind of get like that story kind of vibe going through and through. And I mean, I think the bottom line is this research just wasn't that jaw dropping. Well, the last, <laughs> and I love the, the paragraph on this page. It says, in the absence of clear uh -huh. fossil evidence, that's my yeah. favorite. So what did they look at? The observational, the living mm -hmm. right. evidence, which we agree right? on as far as right. what's You're going to look at living things. You can learn yeah. observational right. science from living things, but anything that's in the fossil record is totally based on someone's interpretations and yeah. assumptions. Don't let the evidence get in the mm -hmm. way, right? That's right. So. That's enough of the fish. Let's move on from that. All right. Scale it back. Although maybe, <laughs> maybe we should stay with the fish. I'm not sure I like this article either. Seattle School wants to spend more time on racial equity programs than on math and science. Uh, and that's really because that's their purpose. These aren't educational centers. They're indoctrinational centers, really, at the core in many cases. But so what's happening here is that schools in Seattle, the school board has ruled to spend roughly $5 million on a new diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, which is really what's called racial equity. This is all 
at its root, critical race theory ideology, which is called anti-racist training, which is a Marxist ideology, utterly anti-biblical. It's actually a racist ideology when you really break it down. We've talked about that many times before in the past. Uh, but they want to spend their time and their money, $5 million, pushing this agenda, equipping their kids to think like radical Marxists to create the revolutionaries in a sense they appear to want. They have different programs that help kids have a racial equity analysis tool, an after-school program for black male students who are referred to as kings in that particular program, all to push this one particular narrative. And then their new budget allots uh, $4.5 million for adding curriculum to subjects like math and science and literacy, those sorts of old things we don't need anymore, right? Spend more time on the equity issues. And all, all in the meantime, by the way, students in Seattle, their proficiency in reading has dropped by 6%, math 16%, uh, nearly 56% of Seattle students have no competence in science, 57% no competence in math, but no, let's spend our time training them to think like Marxist revolutionaries. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you just think about the absurdity of the whole thing, like, right, so if you're a teacher and all of a sudden your students are struggling with math and science, what's the solution? Oh, you teach them more critical race theory, of, of course, course, right? right. Diverse, because math is equity. racist. Yeah, because math and science, apparently, we actually covered that. We actually had an article that talked about why math is racist, and you just think about the absurdity of that whole thing. But By the way, to be clear, according to critical race theory, math is racist, yeah. not yeah, in we're, reality. We're not saying math is racist. Be very but clear about this, that. Is, yes. this is what they're yeah. propagating, but really, I mean, just the whole time I was reading through this, I kept thinking this is just a reminder for parents to really be aware of what's going on in these public schools, not just in, in this state, but all across our nation. We're That's seeing right. that all the way through and through with different school districts and different states, of course. And just a reminder that schools are not neutral, right? They are not neutral. Neutral Neutrality is a myth. And so basically what they've done is they've, inser they've inserted one religion called secular humanism, basically elevating God's, um, elevating man's thoughts above God's word to supersede God's word. So you see that through and through. And so they're trying to propagate that. And like Brian was saying, this Marxist ideology that's completely unbiblical to, to its core in, in terms of what it does and what it teaches. And, um, you know, and obviously that's not the right solution, right? If, if someone, if a, if a child is struggling with math and science, you don't start pushing Marxist ideologies. You start back with the fear of God, really knowledge and wisdom, right? What does Proverbs 1, 7 say? Uh, the beginning of, of knowledge is the fear of the Lord and fools despise wisdom and correction. So really, if if we want to go back to true knowledge, true wisdom, we need to get back to God's word and be teaching that. Which I find interesting too that they're saying 56% of students are not confident in science. Well, the word science means knowledge. Yeah. And so we're 56 right. deficient in just basic understanding of, you yeah. think, biology, chemistry, all of which can confirm the existence of a creator God. We can use science to, you know, use that as a lens and confirm exactly what God's word says. And they're I mean, very, I mean, almost strategically denying them uh, some of the exactness we can see in science, like chemistry. There's a lot of math involved in physics. We can see those mm -hmm. processes in place. They reflect there has to be a designer. Many students have, you know, turned to Christianity because of science, and they say, this doesn't make sense. So let's take that away from them. Yeah. And let's turn them towards critical race theory. It's, I mean, as a longtime science teacher, this is... Yeah, Very frustrating, of the of right? That. It just yeah. doesn't make. It really any, I mean, like, it kind of does make sense when you look at their worldview and what their agenda is exactly and the right. ultimate goal. Based on their foundation, mm -hmm. right? right. Mm -hmm. And just one example of the racist policies being pushed here: pretty much all the money that they have in these DEI, which is diversity, equity, inclusion uh, initiatives, they're all giving money to different groups to help support these different minority groups. So whether it's so-called Black Americans mm -hmm. or Latinos or someone in LGBTQ agenda or it, different peoples, everyone gets help. Everyone gets bonus. Everyone gets money except guess who? Any student who's called white by the definition, well, they're part of the oppressor class. Therefore, they get no help the others do. And so you may or may not get money based on the color of your skin or the shade of your skin, which is a racist ideology. Right. And that's part of the critical race theory. And so bear in mind, it's, it's a horrible ideology. It's unbiblical. It's broken on so many levels, but it is being pushed. And so we've got to be aware of that. It is, yeah. And then gladly moving on from that, although not excited about this one either, but here we go. <laughs> Incredible virus discovery offers clues about the origins of complex life. And my quick response here is nope. 
It does not, all <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, it's a very misleading title. <laughs> very misleading. And so the whole article is trying to figure out where did life actually come from and what role did viruses, if any, play in that particular development of life. And so basically you're looking at things called eukaryotes and prokaryotes and different divisions of the phyla of animal kingdoms and where did ones come from, things with a nucleus in the cell, things without. And really, it's really evolution is trying to explain the origin of life without God. And it's a long article. It gets kind of technical about some of you know, what they believe. But basically, it gets technical because they're trying to explain the impossible. We know life comes from the life giver, which is God. It makes sense in the biblical worldview. Science supports that. Life only comes from life. They're trying to figure out a way to explain how life originated through only natural processes, which is scientifically, logically, biblically impossible. So they're jumping through major hoops to try to figure this out. And it's interesting because I counted at least 15 terms throughout mm-hmm. the article. Might, maybe, That's right. hypothesis, likely, because there's absolutely nothing concrete to back this up. It's once again where you see a lot of conjecture with a little bit of observational science as they said that they, you know, they have discovered these new viruses that are infecting these living archaea. So they are observing this. So there is a little bit of what we say, actual observational science mixed in here. That's, you know, that's interesting. But a virus is not what we consider living. A virus has to have a host to survive, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, it is not point. a cell, yeah. as we would say, as we see right. in eukaryote cells and prokaryote cells who have organelles, who have these functions, uh, that they just don't exist in viruses. They're not considered living. Uh, so that's an important distinction that we can make, created by God, of course, that's right? right. Um, but distinctly different from the cells that they're trying to say that they helped in the evolutionary process. And on the off chance this is your jam, this is what you love studying and researching, we have some really great articles online that dive really in depth in all this. And so you can dive into those deep Mm -hmm. articles online from different scientists, geneticists who really know these things really well, can give you some really good explanations from a biblical perspective on this. But again, just understand they're really trying to reach from the evolutionary perspective to try to explain things from their perspective. All All right, moving on. Speaking of trying to do that, Fossils of earliest ancestors a million years older than previously thought. Changing the story again. So we need, like, we need some sort of buzzer, <laughs> some sort of stinger to come in. That this changes everything. Yeah. Brand new find. Because Get that movie title, like, you know, that trailer. Yeah. Kind we of, do. Kind Someone with a deep voice, a movie <laughs> yeah, voice, exactly. right? Uh, and, and we say that because basically every single show, there's at least one article where they say this new find changes everything we thought about this part of evolution or maybe changes the whole evolutionary over narrative. Over and over again. <laughs> we see yes. it all the mm-hmm. time. Yeah. And the funny thing is, it's kind of like, okay, no, we've got it this time. We've got it nailed down. We've got all the facts. This is how it happened. Again, then give it a month. Oh, no, no, no. Now we've got it. And this is actually how it happened. They give it another month. Oh, well, no, 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 no. N- You get the idea. It's a kind of Mm -hmm. repeated pattern. But basically in this article, they're trying to figure out when did these ancestors so-called of humans actually live in Africa? They're comparing uh, some um, Australopithecine remnants from East Africa to South Africa. Johannesburg, they found some new bones there. And they're trying to figure out the age of these Australopithecines. Australopithecine just means southern ape, all right? And actually, if you look at bones of Australopithecine, see it on the screen, they're very clearly ape-like based mm-hmm. on their orbital structure, the slopes of their face, the lack of any sort of nose bone. It's very, very clear on multiple levels. All the Australopithecines are much like extinct variation of chimp, more yeah, or less, yeah. in all their features. They got chimp-like legs, chimp-like long arms, chimp-like shoulders, chimp-like chi- hips, chimp-like everything. Mm-hmm. But yet, they're still thought to be in some circles, some sort of transition from apes to humans. And so they're trying to get all their dates in a row here because for some of the Australopithecines in the article, well, they were too young to be the actual ancestors of modern humans according to the timeline of human evolution. And so they needed to redate these, uh, these bones to make them older. Lo and behold, they found a new dating method that gave them an older age for these bones that fit yep. the narrative they had from the beginning. Because right. that's what I love. This, they that? actually say yeah, in this yeah. study, they say previous methods methods relied on an analysis of calcite flowstone deposits, but observations showed these are younger than the cave fill, underestimating the age of the fossils. It go. didn't fit their narrative. So right. what do we do? We're going to go find a dating method yeah. that will date these at the age that we're looking for. That's right. Because right? that's the magic ingredient, right. right? Time is always that magic yes. ingredient that makes mm-hmm. it all worth. They're always looking for that more, you know, basically they say mm-hmm. over long periods of time, it had to have all of these slow, gradual changes like we were talking about, of course. And 
Um, speaking of Lucy, we actually have a great exhibit here as well. Oh, we do um, at the museum. Here, here, yep. here at the Creation Museum, make sure you guys go, go, go check it out. And um, we also have some great, great resources. resources as well. I know we're running out of time, but <laughs> if you guys want to learn more about what, what this ape man, how to actually make an ape man, there's a few different ways they can do it. They either make an ape look like a human or a human look like an ape, or they just straight up lie and try to, try to mix and Fabricate and, and it, put stuff together. Them. Yeah. And so we got some really good resources. If you want to go onto our website mm -hmm. as well, answersingenesis.org. Answers uh, just, just, um, yeah, just search ape man. You'll be able to spend millions of years there. Um, check out some of the DVDs we have in the bookstore, some of the books we have. Um, I'd highly encourage a couple of them. Look at this one up here, The Ape Man, The Grand Illusion by Dr. Terry Mortensen. It's very, very good. This is on Answers.tv as well. Mm -hmm. Then we got some other videos by Dr. David Mitten, Three Ways to Make an Ape Man, which is kind of what you're referencing earlier. Great DVD on that. And then mm -hmm. Lucy, She's No Lady, yes. which is another yeah, that's wonderful. A good one. Yeah. Right, and he's, he was an anatomist uh, by profession, does an incredible job. And so it's great science, great details. And it really Really, his videos and the work we do here, it just obliterates the evolutionary narrative. It really does in a powerful way. So you can check all those out. And then I want to mention very quickly, as we wrap up here, first 40 days and nights of music starting August 2nd, which is right it's around It's up. hard Corn. to believe it's, it's been out. a year oh already goodness. since Man. last year. So. And so it's going to be awesome. There'll be 40 days of different artists, Christian artists coming here, singing, being part of the event, different preachers being a part of that. It's a ton of fun. Mm -hmm. Go to 40daysofgospelmusic.com to see the schedule. Maybe plan your visit which day you want to come to see that particular artist or get an annual pass, move to Kentucky, and come to all of it, all right? Whatever you want to do there. I mean, check all that out, yeah. Hey, and if you're going to move to Kentucky, let me let you know this, that we are hiring, all right? And we've kind of given a spiel before, but I'll just say in short, uh, working here truly is amazing. There's no one with a gun pointing at me, making I always me say, say I'm not going to work. Right? I never feel like I'm going to work because I, I just love what I do so oh much. I can't wait to get here yeah. every day. I know Defending I'm hiring in my truth. department. I'm oh looking goodness. for people yeah. too. So right? Absolutely. Yeah, definitely go onto our website. So many jobs mm -hmm. available. So, so many different departments. And so you can plug in, be a part of this ministry, answersandgenesis.org backslash jobs. Be sure to check that out. Uh, but thanks for being with us here today. We uh, praise God that you are here and hopefully that this was edifying to you and encouraging to you. Until next time, keep standing on God's word, defending the faith, and proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. We'll see you guys. God bless.